Hey, it's Mike Hambright. Welcome back for another exciting Flip Nerd VIP show. Today I have with me a special guest, Tony Alvarez, who's a successful California real estate investor, speaker, author, coach. He's known as the REO mentor. This guy has a ton of information to share, a lot of great knowledge. Before we get started today, let's take a moment to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of FlipNerd.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, Tony. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah. Glad you're on. And so... Um, a lot of your work is in California, and I know a lot of California folks, a lot of West Coast folks know you really well. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you for maybe those that don't know you yet. Well, uh, just quickly, just so folks get a kind of bead of uh, my background a little bit, I'm not a real well-educated person in the sense that I didn't have any, a lot of formal education at the beginning. I wasn't born in this country. I came from Cuba during the Castro Revolution when I was five years old and grew up in Lawrence, Massachusetts, a small mill town up uh, in New England where there was nobody else who spoke Spanish and stuff like that. So I, I think those, those kind of things are important to know about somebody who succeeded at, at, uh, at anything because you get to understand you know, the, the makeup of the person, which uh, over right. time I've learned is pretty important. Yeah. So I, I come from a survival type of a background, you know. Um, you grow up in a neighborhood that's half Irish, half Italian, and you're the only, and you, you, I always tell people they considered us to be Martians because they were like, you know, they did not understand Cubans, you know. Right. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, so it was it was kind of different. And then I got into the business. I moved to California back in the 70s. I got into the business, um, you know, I dropped out of high school uh, in my last month. I was just kind of rebellious and stuff. And um, I got into the business as a result of being basically unemployed, having – I didn't have a lot of prospects. And uh, this guy, Dave Delgado, came on TV one night on infomercial and said, basically, any idiot without anything, education, money, whatever – could become wealthy in this in this business if they just you know had the right level of desire and took action and stuff like that. I bought into it. I also bought his course immediately. I didn't even read. I don't think the first three chapters in this one of the books. When he's he sold he sent a huge amount of stuff, yeah, um, and some CDs and went out and started looking for houses. Went out talking to agents and bought my first house. And my parents gave me the first financing. My mom actually, my dad didn't. My dad. I was told most of my life that I was not the brightest bulb. Hmm. I mean, and that was confirmed. I went to Catholic school, eighth grade nun. Everybody's getting ready to go to college, you know, to uh, pick a high school to prepare them for college. And she calls my mother in, and I'm standing there right between them. And she said, you know, Anthony's a wonderful child, but he's just not college material. So you better put him in a vocational school, which my mom did. Like, you know, none represented God, you know, so right. you got to do what they tell you. And my dad, honestly, most of my life was um, because I wasn't, you know, I was an introvert till I was 12. Um, and my mom says, you never said a word. And then all of a sudden you open your mouth and you never shut up since, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, my, 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 my dad was always, you better get a job at the mill because, you know, uh, you may, you know, you're not, you're not the brightest. I got five brothers, you know, and, 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 she, and she'd say, you know, you're not, the, he'd say, you're not, the, you know, you're not. And my brother's tone, you know, I mean, uh, he was trying to, ha that was his way of showing me love and trying to keep me from having pain in my life, right? Yeah. yeah. So through all of that, you know, I, I, none of it stuck, you know, none of that stuff stuck. And I, I just kept going and, um, and, got, and bought that first house and, and, and took off from there, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I, but I've been through, you know, I've been through some hard times as well. Yeah. Now yeah. with buying that course. Uh, you know, a lot of folks buy those courses and never even open the box. <laughs> so, and, and you said you just read a little bit of it, but it's yeah. not a lot of those courses for people that actually do take action, which you later find in my experiences, it really had nothing to do with the course. It was, it was just the catalyst that lit the fire under your ass to go do something. Right. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah. So, no, and, and you're absolutely correct about that. Yeah. Um, 
what what that guy did for me was in that infomercial, which was very well done. But and, and keep in mind, up until that point, there was nobody had done that before. I think he was one of the first guys, you know, to really do that. And but he got me to do two things, which I identified over time. I went back and analyzed my own behavior. Number one is he got me to believe in myself. And he said, you know, no matter how how bad off you are, and he named actually named, you know, even if you're a high school dropout, if you don't have any money, if you don't have any formal education, you know. So I was identifying with this, you know. Right. And then he gets to the end. He says, any idiot can do this, and I thought, that's me, you know. <laughs> so, um, so, but so, so, so he got me to believe in myself, and more importantly, he got me to believe that I could make this happen. You know, it was possible for me. So. Once you lock and load on that, there's only the only thing left to do is to go out and take action. And I guess my background, having come as a as a you know immigrant family, you come here. Although you know, we never stop to think about our situation as anything to complain about. I want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, you know, my whole life was uh, growing up in this country was all about being grateful for the uh, for the opportunities. You know, and uh, all that because you see a lot of nonsense today. You know about uh, people complain about this and that and the other thing. There's nothing to complain about. Just yeah. get out there and do what you got to do. So my parents pushed us, you know, to uh, to think in terms of you're at a buffet. You know, if you're starving, it's because you're not going up and picking what you want to eat. You know. Yeah. So so that's the mentality I think that I had. So it was it wasn't all about reading all the stuff in this box. It was a desire within me to take action immediately to go out there. You know, and I never it wasn't. I guess at some level, it wasn't even about the results. It was about doing the thing. You know, there was a, there's a fire and an excitement in doing it and, you know, yeah. making it, going through the experience of it that I think maybe lacks for some people, you know? Yeah. And I know you're, I know you're big on uh, uh, folks trying to understand why they make decisions and things like that. And if something you just said was really interesting to me because we live in a land now where everybody and their brother's a victim, right? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and you're in a blue, and you're in a blue state too. And I'm in a red state and I can still say that even here. So what do you think? And, and you always hear from folks that not, not necessarily that are immigrants, but they talk about immigrants that move here and they see this as a land with, you know, amazing opportunities. And there's so many native born Americans that feel like they're a victim and, you know, they were dealt a bad hand or something like that. And as a, any successful real estate investor, you know, knows that you've got to make opportunity happen. Any successful entrepreneur. I mean, what do you yeah. think is happening in America these days where folks just can't take, you know, personal responsibility like they used to be able to? Well, you know. Uh, we don't have to get too political here. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, the show's, I, not, the I, show's I, not that long. But, but I want you to realize that, you know, we grew up in my home. Uh, we came from Cuba, right? So we, we, uh, my parents decided that they're going to, uh, you know, take their kids out of there. And it was for a very specific reason, you know. In yeah. Cuba, at the time, when after Fidel Castro took over, the first thing he did was he put into place a military program where I think when you hit nine years old, they basically came, they inducted you into the military. You went away for like six months and you got brainwashed. And you yeah. came back and you, you, you basically became a spy inside the family to, to tell anybody who wasn't, you know, favorable to, to the to, to the Castro government, you know, mm. or who didn't favor them. So my parents decided, okay, we're out of here, you know, we, we got to get the kid. Now, here's Castro with all his military might and everything, and here's my mom, you know, and my mom decides we're, we're gone. I'm, they're not going to take my boys into this. So, the you know, my mom is like five feet, right, and she didn't have a weapon. But yet she was determined to get us out of there. My dad worked as a clerk of courts in the same courthouse where my grandfather worked as a judge for the prior government. So they were not loved. And my mom worked as a school teacher. All those kind of things were hated by, by that new, you know, by the communists because they, yeah, they got to change the minds of the ch children, you know, to the right. extent, by the way, that I was attending even at five years old a Jesuit school where they came in. We used to eat their breakfast. You know, I, I have very few memories, but I have specific memories of, of uh, when I was a kid in Cuba yeah. before we came. And they come in, they put a bowl in front of you, and they go pray to your God for food. So you're, you know, you're, you know, God, give me. I look at the bowl. Nothing. Now pray to Castro. And right. they fill your bowl. Who's greater? You know. So they, my, my mom heard that kind of stuff. She's. We're out of here, right? Yeah. So my mom, without a weapon, and my dad, they they make their paperwork, do whatever they got to do. Next thing we know, we're on a plane to Florida, yeah. and we're here, right? 
So those kind of stories were discussed in our home as we were growing up. And it was very clear to us the value of landing here. Nothing else. We didn't expect anything else. As a matter of fact, my dad brought us up to believe within ourselves that a handout was degrading. Mm. Uh, to have somebody, you know, write you a check to support yourself. Right. You know, no, that's not to say that there aren't people that, you know, you're, you're born handicapped or something that you have some some problem with you, whatever, that you know, but not, not, you know, you're physically fine, you're able. We were brought up to think in terms of there's so much to pick from. There's so right. much stuff to do, you know. Yeah. So today's world is a different world. Um, I think, you know, there's a, in, in, the, in Scripture, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not getting religion on you, okay, but in Scripture there's a thing that says, and the scales fell from their eyes and they could see, you know. I think in the United States we have people walking around blind. They, they just refuse to see that the, the life here is is a smorgasbord of opportunity. I mean, I'm not even from here originally. Not, I mean, and here I am, you know, uh, at, the, at the height of my career uh, within uh, basically 10 years, I made $10 million that I could basically walk away with and say, okay, this is mine, you know, and I can, and I, I, you know, I can own, I can just buy a certain amount of real estate, pay it all off, and I never have to think about anything again, you know. Right. So I have a tremendous debt, as well as all of my family members feel like that to this country and also to pass on, you know, yeah. to other Americans. Anybody who I can kind of help to wake up, you know, that's an obligation on my part, as, yeah. as it is, you know, when, when we think in terms of the military here. I mean, the worst day of my life, the worst day here in this country pales in comparison to, I mean, to, 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 the best day any military guy in Iraq had, right? I mean, I have nothing to complain about. Right. So, right. Um, you know, but only a fool, you know, decides different, decides, yeah. that, you know, oh, no, I'm owed something or other. You know, yeah. We're owed nothing. Yeah, it was interesting. I think you might have said this before we started recording, but you said something about real estate being the equalizer. To Absolutely. equalize people with varying educations. In fact, uh this is, you know, real estate is traditionally, and even today, it's a very different business because there's a lot of smart, when, when Wall Street and hedge funds, a lot of, you know, smart, smarter people start getting involved, it's a different industry now. But traditionally, this has been, uh, this has been the game of who, who can hustle the most or who can be the smartest, but, but it's more of street smarts than it is of, of you course. know, intelligence. Yeah. And so oh. um, I thought that was an interesting comment because... This is absolutely a hustle business, and there's so many people that'll tell you that it's easy, but you and I both know this is not an easy business. It's not a hard business, but <laughs> you, you got to be willing. You got to be willing to roll up your sleeves. No, it, it, okay. And the reason I said all the stuff about people feeling like victims is that those people can't, even if they say they have an interest in real estate investing, they're going to have a hard time because they've already had this preconceived notion that the deck, yes. the deck is stacked against them. Well, that's a very good point that you just made, okay? And that brings us to something that's vitally important. And one of the reasons that I decided at the end of this year to stop actually speaking about real estate and let people like yourselves and, you know, that, that are doing it full on and correctly handle that because I was, you know, I'm really an investor at heart. That's my primary business, okay? And, and you know, I found that speaking and stuff like that was actually taking away time from the thing. You know, I was like divided, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, the only thing that I'm going to be speaking on in the future is really what's behind what keeps us from really making the decisions. You, I see people go to classes. This is what really did it for me. I see people go to my class. They go to my class. I would feel horrible. I go up to a student. I see him again a year later. I'm saying, hey, how's it going? You know, what have you done? I haven't bought my first house yet. Jeez, well, you know, I'm going, I'm taking, I've taken all these classes. I, I would feel like a failure, you know, as, a, yeah. as an instructor. And then until I realized that's not really my fault, you know. Um, but at first I felt like that. I felt like I'm not, I'm taking this guy's money for, for a class and he's doing nothing. How right. good am I, you know? But um, you're right about what you said. People are being almost to a certain extent indoctrinated or, or conditioned to think that someone else is supposed to do this for you. Um, but real estate, if you really, really, it has to, you, it, you have to come to the point where you start taking some action, even the smallest action. I tell people, you just go out, go talk to agents, go just go look at houses, 
You know, go do something. Stop right. thinking about it. You know, stop having this mental conversation with yourself while you're sitting in someone's class or, or debating which is the next class that you're going to take and actually start taking some action. But what is the problem? Underneath all of that, there's this this sense of ourselves where we can't fail or can't make a uh, you know a dumb decision or can't can't make a decision and be wrong or God forbid we should be wrong you know right. uh, you know where, where did this come from you know where yeah. did we think that uh, that every time we're going to do something that we have to do it with perfection you know if you're waiting to do whatever you do get into real estate and make every decision you make perfect I mean. You're never going to do anything. It's, right. it's just not. It's not. It's not going to happen. And then you're setting yourself up for huge disappointment, sure. no matter what the outcome is, because yeah. everything for you is uh, is depends on the result. On the result. On the result. I learned over time, Mike, that the important thing is to move forward, is to take the action. Uh, and I really, I've never been in the military ever, and I. Uh, but I, I really use that as a as a, as my rule or my model for what I'm going to do because you know in the military you got to act you know you can't you, you can't even under the best of situations when that helicopter lands or you jump off and you hit the ground you better move right it's right. not about landing and then going okay what do we do <laughs> you know yeah. maybe hold on uh, sarge we need another classroom meeting thing you know, there's no time for that nonsense. Yeah. So, you know, what's good enough for them is good enough for me. Uh, so I, I think in, in terms of do the thing, you know, do it, do it, do it, find out. Even, by the way, maybe you find out it's not for you. Right. You know, what's, yeah, what's wrong with that? It's interesting that you say what you just said because, um, you know, I always talk about how there's a ton of people that never even get out of the gate. And you know, my thought was always they're they're just kind of lazy or don't find a reason to not get around to it. But I hadn't really considered or thought about the fact that it's the fear of failure to why of they course. never do it in the first place. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a, you know, when you get down to it, I was asked that question. We were we're on a panel, and and everybody was coming out and saying, you know, well, it's because of this. It's they don't have any money. They don't have any this. They don't have any that. I actually taught a class on this: the fourteen most common obstacles to you know getting into the real estate business. I, over the years, having taught people and dealing with different students and all, all that kind of stuff, and I love people. I want I, I want you to know I'm hard. I really am hard because I'm I'm really. If you can't tell by now, I'm a no nonsense person. And when it comes to this country, I I have very little tolerance for nonsense. You know, like for example, before I speak anywhere, I had you know one caveat that i had is that there be an american flag at the front of that room now a lot of people are going to think well wait a second you sound like you know too much like a patriot or whatever well you know what tough yeah. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't for that flag and what it represents i would not have the right to speak in front of you so let's put things in order number 1 is we must honor and respect the things that are our foundation right so i'm talking to you about real estate that's all well and good but what wins me the right? What gives me the right to stand here in front of you and say a word? If we were in Cuba, I couldn't say three words to you without being listened to and someone dictating what comes out of my mouth. Hmm. So are we to take that for granted? Never. So real estate? Let's talk real estate. I have no problem with that. Let's start out by the Pledge of Allegiance before I, I say a word. Yeah. If you know, If you have a problem with that... I'm not speaking at your club. If you can't get an American flag in front of that room, because by the way, you know what I started doing? I found some places would say, yeah, no problem. And then I'd show up, no flag. Oh, geez, they didn't bring it in or whatever. So my PowerPoint, I have a, I have a picture of a waving flag. <laughs> you know, so I'd say, hey, no problem. I brought one with me. You know yeah. what? Now, you know, I have experience where someone has gotten up from the room and walked out. How do you like that? Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm okay with that, you know? Um, so... Real estate business, you want to become wealthy in this business, it's 90% what you decide to do, 10% what you learn on how to do it and who you associate yourself with is of, of importance because you don't want to be hanging around with people that are just complaining and, you know, they're to like a misery pity party. Right. You want right. to get the heck away from that. But uh, I've had people come up to me, you know, and, and, and say, you know, oh, geez, I can't find a deal or geez, I can't do this or I can't do that. Um, I can't to me represents I won't. 
Um, and that's about as clear as I can put it. You know, I have absolutely no reason whatsoever to have made the success in this business if you use the definition that most people use. Everything should go perfect for me. Right. And everybody should be running to my aid. You know, that's not the way it went. And I've been through bankruptcy twice while trying to scale the wall of financial freedom. Hmm. Right. But guess what? I had the right to fail. Right. Um, how do you like them apples? Yeah. yeah I get yeah. to choose, right? Well, tell us a little bit about your uh, experiences with, you know, from getting started to success and the trials and tribulations in between. And, you know, <laughs> obviously, if there if there is a volatile market anywhere, it's in California. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? I, I love the business and um, I've never seen it as anything else except for, you know, it goes through changes, right? Yeah. So, you know, everybody's, uh, and we all have definitions, let's say, of what's a good market or what's a bad market. Okay, and we define that as whether it's plentiful, you know, a good market for us, right, as investors is a plentiful amount of property that nobody else wants right. at that point in time. Because, you know, as that cycle spins out, then everybody wants it. Right. And we're in the position to then let it go, right? Um, but I, I have found really that over time, here's what I've learned, because everyone uses certain type of terminology. They say, okay, I can't find a deal. I found that oh, historically, depending on the point in the real estate cycle where, where, where we're at, um, I probably find, I, I, I would think about, oh, anywhere from 30 to, um, well, depending on the cycle, from 30%, sometimes only 10% of my transactions are found, to 70%. Depends, we have a lot of REOs, you know, real estate-owned stuff, foreclosures, whatever, right. or when the market is tighter, right? Um, but, also, when what's the opposite of that? Making the deals happen, right? You're creating those deals that happen. And, and the reason is when the market is flooded with discounted real estate, where you can literally buy things at 50 cents on, on what it costs to build them, and you can lease them out. You know, you can buy a house for, for, for let's say, in our market for $50,000, cost you hundred grand to build it, and you can rent it out for $1,000 a month. Do the numbers. I mean, right. if, you know, even if you had 100% financing at 12% interest, you're still cash flowing. Right. So you'd be an idiot not to buy it, right? But even under the worst of situations like that, let, let, let's, let, let, let's say you, 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 you have all of these deals. You're, you're out there. Front. Is everybody out there buying stuff? No. So, so is it the market that dictates you know, how, how well we do as investors? Or is it us? And then when the market does go through through uh, changes, you either get sad and depressed, you know, because your life fell apart, right. or you get down and dirty and you get almost excited because you're thinking, okay, now this is I got to find a way to make this happen, right? Yeah, I got it. And those that's the part of this business that I think made me successful. It was the same things that when we landed here, right? What are you gonna do? Stand around and complain. We don't have a job. We don't speak the language. We don't. Oh, oh, people think we're crazy or we're weird or whatever. No, get busy moving. Get busy doing something that's worth that, that that's worthwhile. You know, the real estate business is nothing but a fantastic opportunity for anybody who wakes up and smells the coffee. It's yeah. it, it's it's um, even if you go to the multiple listing system, to the to the MLS, where, where the agents and everybody, you know, it's like going to Vegas to, to gamble, right? That's where everybody throws their dice. We're not talking about going directly to owner sellers or, 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 or any of that stuff, but just, just go there. In any point, in any market, I don't care what, when it is, and you start to analyze that sometimes you can find plenty of deals just on the stuff that's getting listed. That's when nobody wants it, right? Then everybody wants it and it's no longer there. For 24 months in my market, 100% of our deals came from, guess what? The multiple listing, but not from the active listings, not from anything else except for pending deals. Do you know why? 50% of the transactions in my market, it vacillated between 42% and full 50% of them fell out of escrow from one to three times. Just wow. literally went into Now, why was that? Because all of the REOs, the government changed the rules, and they said, no, nah, you got you to gotta give first shot to owner, owner occupants, right? We don't care. Now, you got an FHA house with no windows, but you got to let the guy who's going to get financing, 
you know, for 97% financing, he's got to right. go ahead of you because you're offering right. cash and that's not fair, right? right. It's not, not, we have to treat everybody equal. So there you go. So here comes the guy. He makes his offer. The agent knows it's not going to fly. The FHA guy knows it's not, it's an idiotic decision, but they got to do it because the rules say that's what it is, to be fair. Right. You got to follow those. So what did I do? I drafted the equivalent of what's a letter of intent, right? But I call it a letter of interest. And I send it out to all the pending deals on stuff that I wanted to buy. Pretty soon it became every single pending deal, by the way. And here's what I also learned. That letter of interest became basically a calling card letter. It's the same thing as I call it as a calling card. You ever hand your card to, to people at a meeting? Hey, here's my sure, card. Sure, yeah. Most of them end up in the trash, honestly. Yeah. But that one came with a message that was vitally important to that agent because the biggest complaint that we had in our market was they, they won't stick. You know, we put them in escrow. They, they, and how did I know that? Because I have friends that are agents and I would go in and talk and say, what's your biggest headache this month? Tony, we're selling stuff, going into escrow, falls out. Two weeks, three weeks later, falls out again, falls out again. Three months, and we can't get the damn thing to stick. Finally, guess what? We were buying deals that that they were Fannie Mae, FHA, whoever, government agencies were putting up for sale where they would not drop it a penny at the beginning, right? We're picking them up for 60, 60, 55, 60 cents on the dollar three months later when they have fallen out of escrow because when they fall out of escrow the third time, it's like the rule book gets burned in effigy. They don't care anymore. They just mm. want a deal that's going to close. You know, the conversation isn't any longer about who is the buyer and, you know, how can he qualify, all this nonsense. It's get me somebody to this table that can close this transaction. I don't care who wow. it is and what, what else is going on, you know. So is it about finding deals or is it about making them happen? Yeah. You know, creating them. Yeah. So, you know, that was uh, that's, that was an amazing thing. And, and how did I get that tip? I want you to know. I attend a class that Bruce Norris is doing. Bruce Norris out here in California is an ace. Mm -hmm. he's, I love him to death. He's one of my best friends. But he's a timing guy. And he does his whole presentation on California, uh, California comeback and this and that. And I'm sitting there and I, you know, I hate all that data. I mean, I love to get the bottom line. Just give me the bottom line. So I'm there, I'm there, I'm listening to a full day of this whole stuff, and I am bored stiff. He gets to the point where he's talking to about these statistics, and, 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 and he says, here's a, here's a curious statistic. In California, about 42% of the deals are falling apart at least once to three times, uh, you know, every time they, uh, they go into escrow. I lit up like a Christmas tree, and I didn't know if anyone else caught it, but I was, I grabbed my pad. And I started writing that down, immediately called my assistant, and I said, pull all the stats in our market and find out what our closing percentages are. You know, we came down with 50%. I was like, it's a gold mine. Yeah. That one statement was worth the whole time I came to this class. Just yeah. that. I mean, I literally couldn't wait for the whole thing to end so I could go home and start cracking <laughs> that up. Yeah. Um, so... You know, I don't know if I even answered your question. I get so excited. I don't even remember what the question was. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's an, it brings up an, another interesting question. I want to get some feedback on is the important for it's important for real estate investors to continually reinvent themselves, find new ways to survive in that market. I mean, do you want to offer some advice to folks that you know, need to I kind do. of ebb and flow um, and and always be kind of open minded to those little tips like you just you know the story you just shared. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, here's the basic question you have to answer when you get into this business, because everybody gets in as a flipper, right? Especially if you're, you know, if you if you don't have any money, this that, or you're trying to put it together, or you have some money, you know, you have some partner, whatever. Um, I found a couple of things. Number one, you have to identify sooner or later. You have to ask yourself a very serious question: Am I chasing money, or am I building a business? Because if you're chasing money, you're going to be, the first time you bump your head in this, you, you might get into the business when it's easy to do. You know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit or whatever they call it. And then, you know, you're, and then the changes. And I see these people all the time at clubs going, oh, geez, I can't wait till the market comes back. You know, there's nothing to do right now. I just went into stocks or I'm doing something else or I became a gardener, you know. I mean, yeah. if, if, if you have no staying power and you have no plan, no long-term plan, um, you know, first bump and you're out of the game. So, yep. you know, when I ta started teaching this, by the way, I, I and, and I use this and I'm going to share it with you and, and with all your viewers, okay? Because I analyzed my own behavior as a result of somebody asking me, Tony, will you share with us how you did what you did in 10 years or whatever? So I said, okay. So 
Here's here's what here's what I where I where I landed on. This is what I call the three most important decisions. Okay, number one, you have to decide what you want to do and why. Okay, simple decision. Doesn't it seem like common sense? Decide what you want to do. Do you want to build a business or do you want to chase money? Okay, mm -hmm. the why is the most important part because that's what keeps that's the steam behind your decision. Two, choose a target market and know it better than anyone else or very well. Some people have a hard time with that when I say know it better than anyone else. How do I know? They say. How do I know who knows what? Oh God, you're missing the point, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so for me, the target market was I chose the Antelope Valley because I wanted to learn the methodology of being a professional investor. Then once I got that under my belt, I could go anywhere. I mean, you could go right. anywhere, you know? So, and then the third decision was to load your GPS, which I actually had trademarked because I realized that they didn't, they hadn't trademarked it. It was goal, plan, and systems. Your goal is where you want to go. I don't care if that's 10 houses like it was for me. I wanted 10 houses paid off. Over time, each one of those houses would be worth 100 grand. I'd have a million dollars in equity, and each one would be bringing me in a, a gross of $1,000 a month rent. If I paid 40% to 30% expenses, you know, if I managed it myself, I'd only pay 30, and I'd have six to seven grand a month, and that's all I needed. I don't, I'm very frugal. I don't live a crazy life or anything. And then, uh, and then, so that's uh, that's that's my goal. The plan is how you're going to get there. You buy low, sell high, or however you're going to do it. Lease options, or whatever turns you on or rocks your boat. And then the third thing is systems. Those are the daily action steps you must take. And I'm talking about scheduling them out. You know, Monday, eight o'clock in the morning, I'm in my office. What are you doing from eight to nine, nine to ten, ten to eleven? If yeah. you decide you're going to work with agents and you think you're going to get on the phone and call them before 10 o'clock in the morning, and if it's Monday, you better move that back to about 11, 10.30 or 11, because <laughs> they got so much going on. The last thing they want to do is hear from some investor going, hey, you got anything going on? So, right. <clears throat> you know, having a business plan, so to speak, even though I hate those terms because they conjure up ideas in our minds and limit our actions, um, having a plan that you design, and it's for you. It's nobody else's. Who cares about what anybody else's opinion or what Sally right. or Johnny's doing, right? So you have that. The most important part of that whole thing I just described to you are your daily systems. That's where the rubber meets the road. Your action steps every single day. And what do you do at the end of the day? You ask yourself three questions. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? And what can I do better? Tomorrow. Not next year. Tomorrow. Okay? Yeah. If you do that on the first, the January 1st, of 2015, by the end of that year, do you think that your life is going to look a little different? Yeah, Believe me, if you're if you're true, if Mike, if you're faithful to that plan and you're taking actions and correcting yourself at the end of every 24-hour cycle, there is no you will not even recognize yourself or your results. Mind right. you, keep in mind one thing, and I know I'm talking a lot, and, and I know you no, no, so, great. I, I know you only have so much time, but. Um, Everybody's results oriented, you know. I have to tell you honestly, I gave up results a long time ago. I, if I focus 100% of my attention on my daily actions, the results will be there. They'll, they, right. they'll show up. But if you are always thinking about the results you want, you're in imagination. It's almost like I always tell people, I know it's a, we, we live in a competitive business world, so to speak. I really have gotten to the point in my life where I reject the whole thought of, 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 of competition in that sense. And I've really analyzed some of the best coaches. You know, uh, Vince Lombardi from years ago, the only thing he ever, he ever um, regretted saying was that two teams walk out into the field. One walks off a winner, the others, it's obvious. He took that back on his deathbed. He said, if you make it to that field, you are indeed a winner. So it's about your actions, your actions, not the results of the game or whatever happens. Yeah, you know, in sports, we always want our teams to win, and that's part of it. But what do people do in sports? The individual players go out into that field. What happens at the end of that game after they've literally thrashed each other? They shake hands and walk away. Unless, of course, you're watching one of those soccer games from South America where I'm always embarrassed <laughs> to admit I'm Hispanic every time I see those people do those kind of things to each other. But, yeah, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to have a sense of yourself and a sense of urgency to get the things done that you determine are important, you know. In business, in this business, in, in real estate, we choose initially to chase money. Somewhere along the line, you realize if that's all you do, you are going to be reinventing yourself to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Now, the reinventing of how you do your business, 
that's that's that always changes. You know, if you're in real estate long enough, if you're in this business 30 years, believe me, the internet comes into play. You think you did it all. You think you learned it all. We had to change the way we approach business when the internet showed up. Sure. At, the, at the beginning, we hated it. Now we're loving it. I can analyze transactions across the country. I don't even have to leave this desk. So, you know, you are reinventing yourself. You're absolutely correct about that. But you have to yeah. start with a sense of, you know, where is it that you're going? And, right. and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a combination of both of those things. And one last thing I wanted to say. Sure. I owe my success to the team of people that I have learned, to my business friends, you know. Um, I, I got into this business with a very competitive mindset. Everybody was the enemy. If, if, uh, if I identified anyone else, my job was not only to be better than you, but to squash you. <laughs> you know, I had to eliminate the competition. After a few times, you know, going up and down, crashing and burning, I realized that I could do a whole lot better if I can get all of you guys that are out there to work with me like we're on the same team. To do that, I have to learn not only what is important to me, but I have to learn to love my business associates and I have to learn to care about their success as much as my own. To the extent that I can accomplish that, I have in essence won the lottery. I have yeah. pretty much set, you know, my results are going to be, I got a whole team of people walking with me, you know, as opposed to me by myself, you know, and watching you guys, you know, out there and going, oh, you know, and getting feeling bad. Anytime you take your eyes and put them on someone else as, comp as your competitor, you have your focus off your own actions to accomplish your own your own goals, and that's and that's a poor decision. Yeah, that's great. And you know, I, I say this all the time: is this is a really lonely business. I mean, it can be a really lonely business if you let it be, and uh, it's a whole lot better if you can surround yourself with people and find a way that where everybody wins together. Yeah, and, and without a doubt, because you know. If not, what the heck are you really talking about? You know, you're right. going around creating enemies and, and, uh, and you're feeling not all that great yourself all the time. Now, there are some people that, you know, make a good – it's not to say you can't make a good living. I can tell you from sure. experience, you know, considering everybody the enemy, I made a few million bucks. But what happens is if you spend five or six years of your life fighting everyone else, and, and hoarding and fighting and hoarding and fighting, you get to the end of that and you're a burnout case. You, yeah. there, there's nothing worthwhile in your life. Not to, not to even begin to talk about the destructive nature that, you, you know, that destroys your personal life. Sure, because sure. You, know, you, you, just, you just don't care about anything except that money. Um, but when you're building a business and you look at everyone else as, as really your teammates and people that you have to help, because everyone has the same, you know, to a certain extent, we all care about the same things. You know, we all want to keep the wolves away from our door. We all want the best things for our families. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why would you want to keep that from somebody else? There's plenty to go around, you know. So, right. yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it takes. It took me a lot, a lot longer to learn that. Though I know some people out there know that already, you know, but it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah. Well, Tony, I definitely appreciate you being on today. I know you've got a lot of uh, great information online. I know you're. On the verge of retirement here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I but I know you've got a lot of great information online and sharing your advice and opinions. Can you tell us how to get a hold, how to get a hold of you or learn more? Not get a hold of you, but learn more about. Yeah, my thing. Uh, you my online. thing is simple. It's it's uh, my the, the website address I have is Tony at TonyAlvarez.com. That's probably the only thing you need, you know, to, uh, to get a to, uh, to get a hold of me. I'm pretty open book, like you guys see right here. That's that's uh, that's what I am. Uh, if you call me, you know, if you somehow get a hold of me, send me an email, whatever. I'm open to talk to anybody about anything. Sure. Um, if you ask me a silly question, you know, I'm going to give you a silly response. So, yeah. you know, just keep that in mind because I hold your feet to the fire to just be, you know, use your mind. Yeah. And how, how about your, how about websites, Tony? Um, that, that's uh, uh, TonyAlvarez.com is the website. You know? Okay. So you can, you can email me with questions or whatever you have. You can go to the website. We have a ton of stuff on the website. And I have a, a, a starter kit, which is basically uh, taking you through an internal process of kind of asking yourself a lot of questions and stuff. And we give it all away for free. And at the end of this year, December 21st, I cannot wait. <laughs> God willing, you know, if I make it, um, I'm going to probably open up the doors to that website and – yeah, I'm donating all the money, whatever you know we sell or whatever, which isn't a lot. We don't have, we don't sell a lot of stuff on there. Hmm. Um, I donate it all anyways because I my money comes from the rentals and stuff that I have, and I do quite well, you know. 
Yeah. So yeah. whatever I can do. Great. Well, Tony, thanks for joining us today. It's been my pleasure, Mike. This Appreciate your insights time. and sharing yeah, your story with us. I talk too much. And I, you ask me a question, I'll give you a three-hour answer. No, no. It's good stuff. It's good. It's a good story. And I think, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of folks that can learn a lot from people like you that, that don't let excuses get in the way and just go make it happen. That's about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being on. Take care. It's my pleasure. Are you a member of Flipner.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence? where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market. You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit flipner.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to flipner.com. 